project to share with you the last two sentences. This I wrote three or four years ago. I pray that I will be in the moment to be in touch with the community that many voices are in.
despite all this heavy and special rain, the Jews all sang. The students sang over their comments. Taylor sang while some of their trousers and cobbler sang while many of them had their shoes. The rabbi sang while the women were serving. The Jews all sang. In a moment, each of you are going to speak the word. Blessing, praise, and wisdom.
trying to go deep into the one part we didn't cover in our conversation. Why 400 to 700? Why couldn't they figure it out? It says that only 400 new people came in, that there was so much energy that it felt like that. You have to start a life that I have no doubt would earn confidence in your strength. small and large that can help people feel valued and invited in. A small gesture. When you led Shakri last night, a mashup in your words of meditation and creative writing, you encouraged everyone to come saying, this invitation is special 
especially designed with those feeling intimidated, discouraged, or a sense of not me in mind. I've been there. Never mind that the stunning poetry you have written in our Tilan group as an alleged novice has, <laughs> has always reminded me of the guy who shows up at the pool hall and says, I swear I'll never play pool hall. <laughs> In your closing conversation, you took a risk. You spoke about a deeply disturbing passage in the Talmud about female virginity. You took this passage, named its brutality, and then turned it around through examining a series of stories in this very same chapter of Talmud that reflect a more intimate experience of knowledge. These other stories took women's voices seriously as having determinative knowledge of their own selves. In your readings, you crossed and interwove boundaries of Talmudic genres from halakha to agadah and of rabbinic presence from intellect to pastor. You insisted on shying away from easy answers, either of condemnation or of apology. For your capstone project, you chose to study the stories of two complicated biblical women, Tamar and Rahav, prostitutes, caregivers, and saviors of the nation Israel. The Torah describes Tamar as sitting at a place called Petach Enaim, the opening of the eyes. As she waits, they are veiled to seduce her father-in-law. By way of explaining this name, Petach Enaim, the opening of the eyes, the Talmud tells the following story. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, she gave eyes to her statements. Shed natna inaim ledivareha. When Yehuda solicited her, he said to her, are you perhaps a Gentile? She said to him, I'm a convert. Perhaps you are a married woman. She said to him, I'm an unmarried woman. Perhaps your father accepted betrothal for you. She said to him, I am an orphan. Maybe you are impure. 
She said to him, I am pure. The Talmud smooths out Tamar's audacious story, imagining her as acting fully within the dictates of rabbinic halacha. Leah, you do not follow this particular path of the Talmud's <laughs> rewriting of Tamar. That is not your way. Rather than avoiding or erasing complexity or moral difficulties, you celebrate tension as an essential aspect of what it means to be human and what it means to be a rabbi. With grace, you hold us and you guide us in the places that are the most sticky and messy in our lives. You affirm and delight in the unexpected and the unconventional as you create community for all of us. You encourage us to know when to ask, am I sure? And also to know when to declare with confidence, yes, I am sure, I know this. You sing with us while wisely modeling leadership as simultaneously an act of awe and an act of humility. You study and pray with us as you open doors. The feminist biblical scholar Tikva Freimer Kensky writes, so sitting at the eye opening, Petach Enaim, Tamar is playing a dangerous game. She must close Judah's eyes in the present or else he won't sleep with her. But she must provide a way to open them in the future or she will be in serious trouble. Tamar, as we know, succeeds in this opening of eyes to the future. As she crosses boundaries, Tamar creates a way forward to the future of the people Israel. Leah, may you, like Tamar, be blessed to open our eyes to the possibilities of present and future. May you continue to teach us the Torah's joy of living with unexpected authenticity. Mazal tov. Rabbi Jacob Chatton over to come for our, um, Nehemia to offer to present his talit and Shani to come forward and offer a blessing. Revianco. <laughs> How many years have I waited to address you this way? <laughs> years ago, in a Beit Midrash not far from here, that smelled of cholent and laundry detergent, <laughs> A young man gave a 70-minute senior mishmar in which he passionately admonished his peers to leave the strange little boxes we humans call homes. And you pleaded, go outside. <laughs> in the fall of 2020, you arrived in a new Beit Midrash that was, shall we say, somewhat out of the box. As the leaves turned and the air chilled, we hunched shivering over our Gemaras on park benches, on Camberville balconies, in the courtyard at Herrick Road, or at least some of us were shivering. <laughs> you, who had layered appropriately, <laughs> were leading us in sets of jumping jacks to build heat before outdoor shear. 
I believe JM was uh, invited to join us, but politely declined. <laughs> In the mornings and at midday, you would lead us to the woods to pray. Towards the end of Parshat Lech Lecha, Avraham Avinu begins to feel discouraged. You have made great promises about my future, he confides to God. But I've been waiting so long to see that vision materialize, and it's feeling impossibly far. In response, God takes Abraham outside. Jacob, from your time as an outdoor educator, you have taught me a powerful philosophy of teaching. Take them to the woods and get out of the way. The Torah you offer, your posture as a teacher and a spiritual companion, all flow from this foundation. You believe in accompanying people outside. You walk with us into uncomfortable places. You validate our fear of the shadows. And you show us that there is more than one way to experience the dark. You have sought a Torah that helps us escape ways of thinking that keep us stuck in cycles of shame and despair that brings us instead somewhere different to a space where we can grow. The Rambam counts hotza'at orchim, accompanying your guests out, as the true essence of Avraham's hospitality, among the fundamental expressions of compassion that have no bounds. But even Avraham Avinu got travel weary sometimes. When he did, the divine was there to usher him out the door. Jacob, how blessed we have all been by your boundless hospitality. As a teacher, as a student, as a friend, what a gift your deep listening, your razor sharp reading, your insight, your silliness, and your seriousness will be to those you are going out to serve. I want to bless you with the woods and the mountains, with the stars and the sky. May your learning and your teaching never fit in a box. May you touch lives in ways that cannot be counted. May you feel the good kind of big and the good kind of small. And as you have sent us off and welcomed us in with such warmth and love, so May you be met at every threshold by Pnei Hashchina. Hashem Yishmor Tzedcha Ovoacha Meata Viadolam. Mazal Tov. Invite Rabbi Ben Einsiedler forward. And we ask Shaina to come forward to give Ben his blessing. And Alan to come forward and put on his talit. Rabbi Einseidler. Patach el
Eliyahu. <laughs> the Amar. Elijah opened and said, Master of the worlds, you are one, but not in number. You are highest of the high, most hidden of the hidden. No thought can grasp you at all. These are the words of the Zohar with which you began leading weekly prayers in tefillah group. This prayer before prayer speaks of a transcendent God impossible to know. Eliyahu goes on. You are wise, but not with a knowable wisdom. No place can contain you. Even as you recite these words, you choose Tractate Tamid to learn together for your capstone, a tractate that describes in detail the house of God in Jerusalem. The ability to go from a divinity that cannot be contained to an in-depth study of the Beit HaMikdash brings us to the teaching you selected for your closing conversation that we studied years ago. Tanit 20a. Achiyah HaShiloni curses the Israelites by comparing them to the reed. God will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in water. Bilam, on the other hand, blesses the Israelites by comparing them to the cedar. Matzhovu ohalecha Yaakov, how fair are your tents, Jacob, like cedars beside the water. Cursed as a reed, blessed as a cedar. But a twist, which is the curse, which the blessing? The Talmud teaches that while the cedar is majestic, the southern wind may uproot it, never to stand again. The reed may be tossed about, but when the wind dies down, it remains standing. To seek God in prayer as the entity that cannot be contained, and to study exactly how one serves daily in the house of God, requires the flexibility of the reed. Make for me a sanctuary that I may dwell in them. In them? Shouldn't the verse have said that I may dwell in it? The al Sheikh writes, mikan ki ikar One learns from this that the essential resting of the Shekhinah lies in humanity and not in a house. What is the connection between the people and the house? Sforno comments, Eshkon b'nehem lekabel tefilatam ve'avodatam. God will dwell among them to receive both prayers and service. Prayers to the transcendent God along with day-to-day -day work. To be capable of both is alluded to in the reed flute song by Rumi, introduced to me by your classmate Yaakov. At any gathering, I am there, mingling in the laughing and the grieving, a friend to each. But few will hear the secrets hidden within the notes. No ears for that. Body flowing out of spirit, spirit out of body. This combination of the contained with the uncontainable, body with spirit, work with prayer, being with people in their joy and their sorrow, this is your Torah. It is the powerful Torah of the reed, the reed that merits to write Sifrei Torah, Twilin, and Mezuzot. May you continue to seek God in all paths that open to you as you go from strength to strength. Ad Khan. Baruch Hashem Leolam, Amen ve'amen. Amen. We invite Rabbi Hindi Finman forward.
Rabbi Finman. Oh, that's mm. my father. <laughs> First, we might as well get one thing out of the way. There is no question that you have the best rabbinic job title in the world, <laughs> which includes the director of the Center for Loving Kindness and Civic Engagement at the Jewish Community Center of Greater Pittsburgh. <laughs> Now, I don't want to get into a theological argument about hashkacha pratit right here, about personal divine providence, but it is hard to imagine a role more perfectly suited to your human qualities and more profoundly needed in this historic moment. When asked recently in an interview how you plan to approach this role, you said simply, my door is open. You have a seat at the table. This is the Torah you are bringing into the world, unambiguously welcoming, unambivalently loving, unpretentiously real. How lucky they are to have you as their rabbi. You went on to say, quote, this open door policy means there is nothing you can say that will deter me from wanting to show up again. Now, coming from someone else, I might be a little skeptical, <laughs> but in a time when so many people are busy writing each other off, you are asking a different question. What happens if we write each other in? What happens if we say Torah belongs to all of us? One of the many things I'm going to miss is your seemingly inexhaustible well of questions. <laughs> the way your hand goes up during every Q&A, and when called on, you look down at the paper where you've been feverishly taking notes and say, I actually have five questions, and the fifth one has three parts. <laughs> We all know, we all know when someone is asking a question in order to score a point. This is completely foreign to you. The questions you ask come from a place of deep honesty, compassion, and kavod. They vibrate with aliveness. Your capacity for asking questions is one of the gifts you bring to the work of pastoral care. And yet, you also know how to balance that sincere desire to understand someone else's experience with a deep sense of humility before the mystery of another person's soul. As you taught recently in a beautiful drash, quote, we cannot see into the memories and holes of another person, your poetic rendering of the Hebrew zachar unikeva. I am okay with this failure of a science. <laughs> I marvel at your capacity to hold both knowing and not knowing in the way you care for others. I suspect this has something to do with why you are more likely to offer blessing than advice. I will always remember with gratitude the way you stepped up to offer me a blessing one that I didn't even know I needed when I was preparing for a trip to Israel shortly after October 7th. I offer you this blessing now from one traveler to another. May the Holy One, our God and God of our ancestors, lead you in peace, guide you in peace, support you in peace, and enable you to reach your desired destination. Lechaim ulesimcha uleshalom. Toward life, toward joy, and toward peace.
invite forward Rabbi Michael Frad. <laughs> invite Danielle to give a blessing. And Michael, in your closing conversation with the faculty, you told us of a time prior to rabbinical school, while working on a farm, that you discovered heartbreakingly a newborn lamb that had been rejected by its mother. The mother would not feed the child. You found this situation unacceptable. Along with your housemate, you adopted this stray lamb, bringing it into your home, feeding it, putting it to bed, cleaning up after it, and with a noteworthy commitment to safety, taking it places in a car seat. <laughs> Essentially, you raised it until it could rejoin the herd and live on its own. This story is appropriate not only because you and your partner Jen just became parents, Mazalto, that is one lucky child, but also because shepherding, particularly of stray sheep, has a place of honor in the Jewish understanding of rabbinic leadership. According to a midrash, just before Moshe encounters God at the burning bush, a lamb from his flock runs off. Frustrated and concerned, Moshe pursues it, catching up to it when it stops to drink from a pool of water. Moshe realizes in that moment that the lamb ran off, not just to drive him crazy, but because of thirst, and that it now must really be exhausted. So Moshe carries the lamb on his shoulders back to the flock. The Midrash imagines this as the moment that God understands Moshe Rabbeinu was fit for leadership. To be a rabbi according to this Midrash is to emulate a divine quality of seeing the world as interconnected, and to respond to it proactively and compassionately. At the same time, as one has that expansive divine perspective and behavior, one must be tempered by humility, recognizing and accepting the limits of our perception and that what we think may be happening may not be what's happening. By this standard, your choice to become a rabbi could not be more fitting and appropriate. Like Moshe, your sense of responsibility long precedes you coming to rabbinic education and becoming a rabbi. This community has been the grateful beneficiary of your devoted, caring participation and leadership as this quality and these qualities have only grown deeper roots in you. Your choice to begin your rabbinic career as a hospital chaplain tending to people at their most vulnerable moments is certainly evidence of this capacity and growth. And while you are a person of deep thought and immense talents and intellect, you are also exceptionally humble, present to learn from all you encounter. This too will help you be the wise rabbinic guide and companion we know you to be. But one other thing that critically this Midrash teaches us, and that you also exhibit, is that though these natural and nurtured capacities make you fit and ready to be a rabbi, the Midrash understands leadership as witnessed and affirmed from beyond us. It takes God recognizing that Moshe is ready for him to become a leader. As much as we choose this path, 
as much as you've chosen to become a rabbi, you are sent and always supported and nourished by our divine source. Or to use your stunning insight as you sat with friends around a Shabbat table shortly after the discovery of this poor lamb, your experience of caring for the neglected lamb mingling in song with Psalm 23, Adonai ro'i lo echsar. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. As you go forth as a new rabbi and father, may you keep emulating Moshe, expressing your leadership as an act of loving and humble care and concern. And may you know and keep returning to the gift of God's affirmation for your needed work. Mazel tov. We're going to take a 52 second break. People want to shake it out a little bit. Um, I want to, while you're taking a break though, I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> and maybe we'll take a break and we'll actually just take a break. Yeah, don't leave, don't leave. Really 52 seconds, which is now only 23 seconds. Uh, we we're going to start again. I was, it was for real. Just was just meant to stand up. I want to take a moment and thank a group of people and honor and acknowledge them. Um, this group of, uh, every year, our 10th year graduates um, take upon themselves the task of uh, raising money for a scholarship for Hebrew College in honor of their 10th year uh, ordination. And so we're grateful to them. And I, is there anybody from the 10th year class who is here today on stage? So if the two of you would please stand. Feels like yesterday, yeah? Yeah. Mazel tov. Thank you, thank you. If I can ask, we are truly going to begin if people can come find their seats again. I'm going to call Rabbi Naftali Hirschford. We were um, deep in the middle of your job process. You did not know exactly where you were going to end up, and you had different possibilities with very different timelines, and you were weighing which one was best for you, and Baruch Hashem, you ended up in the place where you needed to be. There was a lot of timing going on, asking places for time, thinking about time, trying to make this all work. You were super deep in it. And really kind of at the height of it, you said to me, when do I tell them I'm taking a week-long silent retreat tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, Hebrew college. <laughs> I said something subtle and wise, like, what? <laughs> 
And I was simultaneously horrified that you were not going to speak for a week in the middle of a job search. But I was impressed, inspired. There is a seriousness about your commitment to cultivating an inner life. We say at Hebrew College, we want people who are seekers and have a spark, a passion for finding the still small voice and to see someone actually willing to live it, willing to take some risk to find it, was inspiring. You said this amazing thing during your closing conversations with the faculty. You said you came to Hebrew College with answers and you're leaving with questions. And I have this image of you, Naftali, and you mentioned sort of growing in humility which is really a kind of growing and shrinking at the same time. It's a growing and a shrinking, an in and an out, an image, if you will, of expansion and contraction, a breathing, a growing and contracting. You've changed over these years, and Aftali, after you shared, as you shared with us. And part of that change was your name. Naftali. It's a great name. Such a great name. I named my child that name. <laughs> and we chose that name because of Rashi. Biblical text says, Batamarachel, Naftule Elohim, Miftalti im Achoti, Gamichalti viti Krashmo Naftali. Rachel said, in one of the many different translations you can find, a fateful contest I waged with my sister, and I have prevailed. So she named him Naftali. But if the commentators can agree on one thing, they agree we really have no idea what Naftali means. <laughs> Rashi brings five different possibilities. He says it might come, the word Naftali might come from the word lid. Maybe it means crooked. Maybe you switch the letters around and you see that the word naftali comes from the word tzfilah, prayer. Maybe it comes from nofet, meaning honey. And finally, Rashi seems to throw his hands in the air and says, there are many, many explanations that have to do with letters standing for other words. Those who understand will understand. <laughs> I love that you took this name because it's rich, it's complicated, and it feels very much like you. It encompasses sweet honey. It encompasses struggle. It encompasses joining with others as a lid joins to a pot. It encompasses prayer. And ultimately, ultimately, it's a mystery that needs to unfold and we need to have the patience and stillness to watch it see it come into the world. She calls him Naftali. We call forward Rabbi Aaron Lipson. Uh, Alan Lipson. Alan Lipson. See, oh, it says Alan. It's all good, Dan. Yeah, you're good. You're fine. You're fine. Wow. Um, I could explain that, but I won't. I'm just going to take your saying I'm all good and walk away quietly and hide in my seat. And we're going to invite Shani forward to give you your blessing. And Jane, Come to put your tellies yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Brother Allen. In a 1905 journal entry, a disgruntled Mordechai Kaplan worried that moneyed powers were using institutions of Jewish learning as a means of maintaining their status quo. The schools themselves, he lamented, were, quote, nothing but social pacifiers. On a 2021 walk in Inman Square, a recent transfer student to Hebrew College <laughs> asked his friend and teacher, do you think it's possible to build a community committed to halakha not based on social coercion? <laughs> Alan, you have been asking this question with deep sincerity for as long as I have known you. Actually, you ask every question with deep sincerity, <laughs> beginning with, Shani, how are you? <laughs> Despite such sweetness, you are not interested in a Judaism that pacifies. Yiddishkeit should activate us. It should move us and make us move. Perhaps this is why you intuit that halakha should be a force for radical change. Halakha forms a bridge between the world we live in and the world we imagine. Or as Bialik put it, tsme'im anu ligufe ma'asim. We are thirsty for embodied action. Such thirst is the meeting point of your commitments to organizing and justice teaching and learning Torah and mitzvot. From Jews and activists, all need the wisdom of our ancestors to weigh in on concrete, complex questions about how to live. It is this invitation to grapple with genuinely unresolved questions and the belief that Torah has something to offer in response that has brought you deep into the discourse of Shutim. And from this place, you turn back toward the world of policy and politics and welcome a whole new set of questions into the conversation. Surely, this is halakha, not just checking one another's tzitzis, but asking what does it mean to maintain a rich, distinctive culture under the flattening force of capitalism? Not jousting over who can read the hardest shach in the Beit Midrash, but presenting medieval responsa to a panel of debt cancellation experts as rabbinic Q&A, sort of like a Dear Abby. <laughs> His words, not mine. <laughs> This year, you thought a lot about tochacha, the mitzvah to rebuke. Our sages link tochacha to conversations about embarrassment and about humility. We are not allowed to take advantage of someone's bad behavior to cause them shame. But nor are we praised for anava shalolishma, for shrinking back from speaking, speaking truth out of fear of ruffling feathers. Alan, you have taught us that good organizing, tochacha, and halacha are all built on something stronger than social coercion, an expansive web of relationship that binds us to one another in shared conversation, shared questions, and a shared commitment to do better. Rabbi Lipson, master relational weaver, Shadchan of the ancient and new. May the relationships you form open channels through which the words of our ancestors can see and shed light in new places. May the effortless love 
with which you receive our confusion bring us closer to clarity of action. May your anava lishma, your genuine humility, blossom as your learning deepens, so that when you challenge us in your gentle way to move beyond the status quo, we are with you and ready to be moved. Mazalto. Rabbi Heather Renetsky to come forward. No, no, wait, no. This is this. No, it was changed. Um, okay. We, just as I was saying, uh, we ask Rabbi Eliana Willis to come forward. Rabbi Willis. <laughs> In Tractate Sota, the Bavli presents us with an extended discussion of Birkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing. It interrogates the language in which this blessing must be recited, the posture of the priests, the position of the priest's hands, the use of God's name, and the location of God's presence. Birkat Koani must be recited in the way that a person would speak to her friend, that is, face to face, panim keneged panim, and out loud, bikol ram. Indeed, the Bavli teaches us, we humans are not the only ones that need this blessing. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Minayin sheha kadosh baruch hu mitavet levirkat koanim shneemar v'samu et shemi al bnei Yisrael v'ani avarachem. Said Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, from where do we know that the Holy Blessed One desires the priestly blessing? From the verse, and they will place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Eliana, you pay close and careful attention to, to the details of relationship, whether to the words of Torah, to people, or to the words of God. You have a remarkable ability to read slowly and contemplatively. As a result, you notice radical readings that others too often miss. You understand that joy brings us to Torah and that there is great joy in Torah itself. This is true in your work at the Teen Beit Midrash and now at your work at Temple Amuna. <laughs> you seek through ecstatic prayer and you bring us with you on that journey. You are, in the words of your classmates, the Hallel Queen. <laughs> <laughs> In your closing conversation, you taught us a powerful ritual that you created as a Bat Kohen. It is a ritual of mikvah immersion for a Kohen or a Bat Kohen to perform after coming into contact with forbidden Tumat mate, corpse impurity. It is a ritual in which, through the words of the prophet Yermiyahu, 
and the words of Mishnah Yoma, you imagine yourself immersing in God's hopeful presence, Mikveh Yisrael Adonai, the ritual bath or hope of Israel is God. In this ritual, you sought to honor, acknowledge, and respect the halachot that apply to you as a person of priestly lineage. And you also sought to honor, acknowledge, and respect your commitments to pastoral gentleness, to being with people in moments of suffering and mourning, to the mitzvot of visiting the sick, comforting mourners, and burying the dead. You recognize that change happens in body and spirit, in our physical and emotional beings, and that we must notice and integrate our many different commitments. In your words, though you have commanded Kohanim not to have contact with Tumat Mate, I have chosen to be present for this person and their loved ones as an act of service, hoping to create loving kindness in the world. Eliana, you love God's Torah, and it speaks to you all the time. With humility and care, you bring us with you on that journey. But you also bring God on that journey. For when you immerse yourself in God's presence, and when you rec recite Birkat Kohanim, you also help God to fulfill God's desire and need to bless all of us. Eliana, may you continue to be a vessel for God's Torah, to enable us to bless one another with loving kindness, and to create the space for God to continue to bless all of us as well. Mazal Tov. We ask Rabbi Jessica Spencer to come forward. Rabbi Spencer. <laughs> In your very first semester at Hebrew College, you gently announced yourself to me as a remarkable student with an essay in which you rewrote a Tosafot. <laughs> The Tosafot that you rewrote is found in Tractate Rosh Hashanah. This Tosafot addresses a question about a line in the Rosh Hashanah liturgy. Zehayom t'chilat ma'asecha, zikaron liyom rishon. This day is the first of your acts, a commemoration of the first day. I am not here going to describe in detail the original Tosafot, but instead turn to your words. You asked, what would this Tosafot look like if Rabbeinu Tam and the Tosafists had chosen the subversive reading, the queer reading? How would the halacha be different? Let us imagine a new Tosafot. And then you went on to rewrite this Tosafot. <laughs> you did so not only in English, but also in the mix of rabbinic Hebrew and Aramaic that characterizes the genre of Tosafot. <laughs> I'm going to quote now your own Tosafot, or part of it. Omer Rabbeinu Tam, De'elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. Ve'ika lameymar demitishrei ad nisan haya biyachad, ve'hadar nivra chalakim bena moadim, u dekavata eshkachan beperek osin pasin, Gabe Adam, Shedu Partsuf Panim Hayalo. 
Rabbeinu Tam said, these and these are words of the living God. One can say the Tishrei until Nisan was undivided, and then divisions were created between the seasons. And we find in accordance with this in Masechet Eruvin, in the case of Adam, who was created with two faces. Jessica, in your rewriting of this Tosafot, you display your commitment to difficult questions, to reading with rigor, to delving deeply into our classical texts, to being unsatisfied with simple answers, and to playfulness. Do we need to decide whether the world was created in the month of Tishrei or the month of Nisan? No, you answer. <laughs> the world was created in an undivided time that stretched from Tishrei to Nisan, just like the undivided first human being. The halakha, the law, remains the same. We do still recite, this day is the first of your acts, a commemoration of the first day on Rosh Hashanah. But now, when we celebrate the new year, you teach us that we are to celebrate a world of multivalent possibilities. Jessica, whether you are interrogating halakha and agada, grief and joy, or war and peace, your gift is to insist that we remain in conversation with one another and with our sacred texts for as long as we need to stay in that conversation. Yet you also recognize that this conversation cannot and does not happen on its own. It needs a foundation. As a teacher, you have founded and built Azara, a Beit Midrash in the United Kingdom that seeks, again your words, to open the complex world of Torah to everyone in order to help us to build the skills to unlock our texts and traditions. This is a courtyard, an azara, in which you have welcomed and continue to welcome all of us. Jessica, you have a rare and wondrous ability to seek out the multiplicity of words of our living God and teach us those words. May you continue as a rabbi and as a scholar to help us imagine what these living words of our God may be and who they may help us to become. Mazal tov. We invite Rabbi Jacob Weiss to come forward. Shana to put on Jacob's talit and Rabbi Klein to offer a blessing. Rabbi Weiss. <laughs> Jacob, in the opening lines of the Amidah, we describe, describe God with the familiar words, Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Why? The question has been asked over the millennia, do we repeat Elohei, God of? We could have simply said Elohe Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The answer says the Ma'or V'Shemesh, a 19th century Hasidic Torah commentary, is that though all Jews are part of the lineage of Abraham, that we could have simply said Elohe Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, to be a true inheritor, one must also individuate and innovate. Avraham's path requires a leave-taking. One can't just do mitzvot anashim melumada, mitzvot by rote. Isaac, Jacob, your namesake, 
And all of us need to form our own relationship to God and Torah, Kefi Darkenu, in our own unique way, learning to call the God of Abraham our God. Jacob, you follow in the footsteps of our ancestors and your namesake so fully and majestically. In your soul, you have always been inseparably tethered to our tradition. And you have wandered and sought your own path. Part of your coming to Hebrew College was to continue your process of return and reclamation. And though it's often romantic to talk of journeys and leave taking, such work is actually arduous, uncertain, and scary as we encounter so many places of alienation, shame, and disappointment. It's a process that requires courage, strength, and perseverance to remain on this path. Jacob, you are an inspiring model of these meat dot, these character traits. And truly amazingly, you paired them with equanimity and humility, communicating with your being with a characteristic shrug of your shoulders that there's really no other way to live but to turn towards brokenness and try to heal, so why make a big deal of it? <laughs> Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, the book that you spent a lot of time for your capstone project reading, teaches Yitron Haor Mina Choshech. Greater is the light that comes from the darkness. Jacob, you have the gift and capacity to find light through and within darkness. Or to put it as our friend Tom Marshall said, to sink just below the churning and froth and swim to the light source, hearing what he calls the theme from the, the bottom. Hamevin yavin, those who understand, understand this reference. <laughs> You exude and inspire a deep inner, inner amuna trust that there is light in the dark and a sense of joy at the gift of being alive. And you share this with the world. Our community and so many others have benefited immensely from your presence as you weave us more closely together amid our distracted, disconnected lives. It is so fitting that you've chosen to continue serving as a rabbi at Northeastern, where you have been interning this year. In this place of deep alienation, what you offer is desperately needed. Our rabbis teach that Yaakov Avinu established Mariv, the evening prayer when he fled from his home by Yifgaba Makom and crashed into Makom, a name for God. He crashed into God in the night by Yalen Sham. And he slept there, he stayed there. Mariv is an expression of faith that we too can find and remain with God in the nights of our lives. You live this in your being and teach it to all of us. In your life and as a rabbi, may you continue to have and find trust in God that there is light in all places, even the dark ones, as you steadfastly, calmly, and joyously guide all of us through it and to it. Mazel tov. Now, Rabbi Heather Renetsky, please. <laughs> As a toddler, you regularly raided your family's linen closet 
Why? Because, of course, you felt it was your job to make sure every stuffed animal in the house had a comfortable place to sleep. You would, I know, you would, you would empty the closet of every last towel, washcloth, and pillowcase because, again, of course, each stuffed animal required a sheet, a pillow, and a blanket. No one would be neglected on your watch. Oh, Heather. <laughs> this explains a lot. <laughs> the depth and breadth of your compassion, the unyielding sense of responsibility, the rigorous work ethic. <laughs> the signs were all there from early on. I am guessing you were already reading children's books to your stuffed animals as well. <laughs> we have been so blessed by your presence in our community, by your very big heart, your commitment, your wisdom and maturity, your tireless work on projects, big, small, and enormous. <laughs> Wherever there has been a need, you have stepped up. No one would be neglected on your watch. To paraphrase the words of Rabbi Nahunya's prayer that you taught at your closing conversation, as you leave our Beit Midrash, Anachnu notnim hoda'a al chelkech. We acknowledge and give thanks for your portion. Our Beit Midrash has been better, more loving, and more learned because of you. In 1959, the philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote that the world lies between people and expressed concern that more and more people had retreated from the world and their obligations in it. She noted that, quote, with each such retreat, an almost demonstrable loss takes place. What is lost is the specific and irreplaceable in-between which should have formed between this individual and their fellow human beings. Heather, you have never retreated from this irreplaceable in-between. You have committed yourself for caring to caring for the world that lies between us. This has been and will be a profound gift to any and every community you serve. Perhaps this is why you resonated so deeply with the words of Mary Van Cleek about the women's movement protesting rising kosher <laughs> meat prices in the early 1900s. Her words, quote, the Jewish girl has the foundation of that admirable trait, public spirit, and a sense of relationship to a community larger than the family or the personal group of which she happens to be a member. Heather, I understand you wanted to put this quote on your refrigerator, so I took the liberty of ordering this little <laughs> refrigerator. <laughs> My bracha is adapted. My bracha for you is adapted from a blessing that you offered in Waterville, Maine, where earlier this winter, you, again, of course, created a ritual for the harvesting of lake ice <laughs> in order to create a mikvah where Jews by, choice, Jews by choice could be welcomed into the community. May the Holy One, Makora Chaim, fountain of living waters, mason whose tools are glaciers, rivers, oceans and rains bless you as you go forth to create gathering places of welcome, renewal, and transformation. May you draw water with joy from the wellsprings of deliverance.
Rabbi Shana Rhodes and I will now read the smicha document, the text of ordination. This statement expressing our trust in you and your new rabbinate is from your teachers as well is on behalf of the people and communities you will serve as rabbis. So let me ask you to stand now. And let me ask faculty, please stand now. And when we come to the very last section, Shane is going to ask everyone to stand as they are able to join us in ordaining you. Anu. Morei Beit HaMidrash L'Rabbanim Shel HaMichlala HaIvrit. Modi'im Ne'emana Ki Talmidenu Elu. Shechelkam Miyoshvei Beit Midrashenu Siyimu Et Chukei Limudehem. We, the faculty of the Rabbinical School of Hebrew College, give faithful testimony that these students have been devoted participants in our house of learning and have completed the required course of study for rabbinic ordination. Ze kama shanim shakdu al hatorah va al haavoda viagu bahalacha u vagada benigle u vinistar u vahachshara la sok betzorchei tzibur beemuna betorah tashem chetzam velo zazu mimena ad she asa uha torah tam. During their years here, they have been eager and diligent in the study of Torah, in prayer and in service, and have studied Jewish thought and Jewish practice, searching for meaning, revealed and hidden. The Torah of the Blessed Holy One is their desire, and they have been steadfast in making that Torah their own. Besod chaverim makshivim Asu oznam ka afer keset, vilibam chadre chadarim, lihipatach le shivim paneha shel Torah, lil mod ulilamed, lishmor vila asot, liman karevet libot adat Yisrael, limtso kol echad vaachat, et nativ nishmatam patura. Amid a circle of listening companions, they have opened heart and ear to the 70 facets of Torah, to study and to teach, to keep and to fulfill, to draw the hearts of Israel near so that each individual might find their own path in Torah. Please rise. Ve'al came, Chacham Yid Karu, Virabi Yid Karu. Umilenu et Yadam, La Seit et Misrat Harabanut al Shechmam. Urinum Nechonim Umuchanim. La Amod Kol Echad Vachat, Lefne Haeda, Asher Tiv Harbam. Vekahalei edatam alehem yismochu, kasher samachnu anu. Vaalehem tovo birkat tov. Kol mindain samochu lanu, lana. Therefore, they shall each be called rabbi. We have ordained them to take upon themselves the service of the rabbinate. We attest that they are fit and prepared to stand before com communities that may rely upon them as we have in ordaining them, and may blessings of goodness come upon them. Mazal tov. <laughs>
You have acquired the Torah of the hard one. For the pandemic to the back Sabbath of October 7th, through far-flung quarantines and Zoom fatigue, this year you graduate under the specter of the hostages still held in captivity, the war in Gaza, and the rise of global anti-Semitism. Yes, you emerge as rabbis into a harsher, meaner world. But I look at you all, and I am amazed. I am in awe of your Torah. I believe that your Torah is deeper, more your own, because it was so hard won. My mother, Zichona Levracha, would say that the best gift she could give me was resilience. And I would say you acquired that gift, that gift, the Torah of resilience, a source of strength to stay the course, a ballast against the wind. So with what could I possibly bless you? Rabbi Yochanan adjured his students to make their ears into a funnel or a hopper, a se oznecha ke'afal keset. What's an afal keset, <laughs> you might ask. And I know that's English, uh, but what's a hopper? Uh, so I won the Jastro jackpot on that one, and uh, still I felt compelled to dig a little deeper, and thank you, Harvey Skunek, for looking this up for me, an article, okay? So a hopper is a funnel used to transfer grain from one container to another. You might have known that already, but I didn't, okay. But the word afal keset relates not to water, not to grain, but to water. Mm. It derives from a Greek word, hadra arpax, which is another word for a klepsidra, which is a water clock, <laughs> literally a water thief. In the ancient world, they keep time by filling a large bowl with water, and at the bottom of the bowl, there was a little hole that they uncorked, and the water would drain out drop by drop, drip by drip, in order to keep time. Now, we all know that Torah is like water. Maim chaim, it slakes the thirsty soul. So in Rabbi Yochanan's words, I urge you to make your ear into a water thief, <laughs> a klepsidra, a se oznechem ke'afal keset, that ancient timekeeper, a bowl filled with water. But make the hole in the bottom just right for the timing and for the receiver, and let the waters of Torah pour slowly into some other happy cup. Keep it rolling, keep it flowing, keep it changing. May your hard-won Torah be a blessing to the Jewish people and to the world.